we're getting judged all the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, and not even at work, just all the time. <laughs> people are always looking at people and critiquing what they're doing, how they're doing it. You know, so everything from the way that our people answer the phones, you know, that's the first one. You bet. Depending on how good that phone call goes, that's going to set the stage for what's expected, you know, for the rest of the dealings with our company, you know, and then how do we pull up? Do we pull up on the right side of the road or do we just pull on the other side of the road because it was more convenient than driving past us, turning around or worse, one of my pet peeves. And I mean, I just want to shake people when they do it, when they pull up against traffic and park on the the wrong side of the road, you, you know, they're right in front of the house. But it's man, great for them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's not. They're, they're I know. Just, they don't think like, so yeah, it's, you pulled up, it was easy for you. Right. But most of the time you're getting your stuff out of the passenger side and you're standing in traffic. Like you didn't even protect yourself. Like you're just not thinking. Tradesmen built America, not policymakers or desk jockeys, but hardworking blue collared men and women. Join me. Roger Wakefield on conversations with some of the nation's most successful skilled laborers. This is the Trade Talks. I've heard you talk about how deep you go into a unit mm -hmm. just to do an inspection. Yeah. You're, you're there at a house to find out what's wrong and you go probably 10 times deeper than anybody else ever. Yeah. Why do you do that? I just don't want to have problems. I think younger, never had a lot of stuff new. Things would be hand me down. Things that I wanted, that I desired to have, couldn't get brand new, right? So then you end up getting the used thing. Well, I wanted it to look like the new thing. So I would get things and like take them all the way apart, you know? Um, I don't know. I just uh, think I'm a bit of a perfectionist and I, I just don't want to come back. I don't want to miss something. I, I think there's a little bit... I, I think a fear of being wrong. Boy, another big one. You know, and it's like, I know I came here for this, but, you know, how do we, you know, just kind of have that tunnel vision and see this one thing and not look at everything else while we're here? People aren't going to get, you know, you come out and you got a bad capacitor, you know, and then something else completely unrelated to that capacitor goes out it's a, all your a month later. You, you know? bet. And, and the, the systems, it, it, it's an older system. You know, then they're not going to be receptive to, well, hey, look, it's old, man. You should expect this thing to break all the time. Why the heck wouldn't you at least, you know, look at everything to make sure? Or maybe even have that conversation like, hey, you should expect this thing to break all the time. So, yeah, I just, I don't ever want anybody to be able to come behind me and say some of the things that I end up saying about other people. <laughs> you know, so when I sit here and I, I go to a house, maybe it's just even a maintenance you know, and I go look at the unit, have a conversation with the homeowner, set the expectations, go through everything, walk through the whole house, and we get to the outdoor unit, and I just see how dirty it is because no one's ever done it right. Mm -hmm. They either didn't care or they didn't know what it took to do it right. And I'm looking at all these things going, oh, my gosh. Like, And I'll never, you know, directly try to throw shade right at them. I speak very vaguely, you know, and I don't try to say, oh, the, they screwed you over, and they might not have known. You, you bet. You know, and, and there's there's a lot of good people out there. There's a lot of bad people out there. But I think we've got more good than bad. I just think there's a lack of training and knowledge, and people don't know what they don't know. You know, so when I come in and I see all these things, I just think, like, man, I would hate for anybody to ever come behind me and be able to say that I didn't do this or that because I didn't know enough or because maybe I just wasn't good enough. So I think there's a little bit of... of never wanting to be not good enough that I make sure I cover everything and I want to be the best person that's ever been out there. And, and I knew I was going to get on this today because because the day I heard you say it, I thought, man, that is so cool. I've had HVAC guys come out to my house before and clean my unit with a water hose and a spray tip on. Yeah. And that was how they cleaned it. Yeah, from the outside, uh -huh. like, like uh -huh. what Mother Nature does. You bet. Yeah, like raining on it. Yeah, it just rained on it. How do you clean a unit? I take the whole thing apart. The whole thing. Yeah. Most of the time, the whole thing's coming apart. For one, when I first started, that's how I was trained. I wasn't trained on how quick you can do this. Isn't that amazing? Do it right. I was trained by some great plumbers. Yeah. And people always ask me, why do you do that? Because it's the right way to do it. Yes. And it's what you know. You bet. And once you know, you know, if you've got integrity, 
once you know the right way, you, you don't want a shortcut. You know you're 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 cheating. You bet. And it doesn't feel right. Uh huh. So when what I first learned it was you took the whole thing apart. Now that was great for me because my whole life I took everything apart. And when you say take the whole thing apart, you just don't mean take the cover off and no. Our customers, uh -huh. I can do that because you know you've been because there it's been done right and then it's been maintained. Most of the time when we're talking about maintenance, I think what a lot of people do that they call a maintenance, I would call an AC check. Like we offer an AC check if somebody's selling the house, buying the house. Yeah, you can pretty much drive by, look at it and yeah. say, yep, it was great. Yes. So I think a lot of companies, when they call it a maintenance, they're not really maintaining anything. They're just checking boxes. Yes, this thing is this and that's that. Yeah, I'll look at it as but, good. But where's the maintenance? What did you maintain? What did you clean? Mm -hmm. So the... um when I've been out to a house and I've stripped the system all the way down to where it's literally just the AC pad and coil sitting there and I've cleaned everything, you know, uh, aside from getting out polish, yeah, yeah. polishing, yeah, copper, like yeah. it's not getting any cleaner. I know that when I come back that next season, it's going to be a lot easier. You know, some of the machines you have to take the sides to get the top off. I don't like taking the fan out of that top lid. For one, you're leaving an inch or so that you can't clean. Too, you're 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 risking damaging and bending the the, the fan blades. You're right. Some, sometimes people wonder, man, how the heck did my fan blade get bent? Because somebody was pulling it out of the shroud. It's not meant to do that. Yes, I get that there's screws there, but that's for when the guy before you screws up the fan blade and you got to change it all yeah. off. Yeah, and they wonder why it's shaking <laughs> like that because he cleaned it pulling it out, and you can see the scratch marks on the inside of the shroud, so you know what happened. If we've never been there, it, it's getting stripped apart. In certain machines, I, I just take them apart anyways. For me, it's easier. You know, some guys, they sit there and they wonder, or, or they they don't want to spend the time, right? They're going, oh, man, I don't want to take all this apart. That's going to be this much time. But then they spend more time if they're really trying to clean it without disassembly. So it, it's a lot easier. And I've, I've talked to other, other guys that have kind of come and gone with us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they came from other places. And I'm like, oh, this is how we do it. And they think, oh man, that's that that's that's a waste of time, and you're putting yourself out of liability because you're taking more things apart. I'm like, not not if you know what you're doing. Like if you've got guys that you're worried about them taking it apart and their ability to put it back together, then train more your guys training. better. Yeah, like make them better. Don't yes. make it easier for them. You know, make it easier for them by giving them the knowledge of how to do it right. So yeah, the the biggest thing is I don't ever want anybody to come behind me and say he didn't do it well enough. Yeah, I love that. One of one of the best plumbers I ever worked with. I remember asking him one day, I said, so why? Why do you do everything perfect? Because it's a lot like you. If we took something apart, we took it completely apart. We cleaned it right. We put it back together. We checked. We double checked. You know, in plumbing, one of the things that I can tell by looking at a plumber are the letters on the pipe turn the right way when they install them. Because I was taught you turn them all facing the same direction. When you put no hub bands, the nuts are all facing the same direction. They're all on top, facing the front or, or however it is. And you may have put it together from the back. They're all facing the back. That's okay. They're uniform. Yes. And I asked him one day, I said, why do you do everything perfect every, every time I see you? And he says, you know, the, the one thing I've never wanted is to be out at a restaurant or a big box store or something like that walking through and somebody come up to me and I've got my family with me and they say, you didn't do my job right. Mm. I mean, how huge is that? Now, you, now you're there with your kids and you're like, you know, but wait, I did it the best I could or did it how I was taught or hey, I was in a hurry that day. Yeah. And One man, I heard him. Superman. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, but, but I heard him say that and I thought, wow, what, what a way to look at it. Yeah. You know, none of us want to be out in our communities. And have somebody come up and say, I had to call somebody else to fix my thing because you broke it when you were in there. And it, it cost me a lot of money. And that just it blew my mind. But but I love that mindset. And I'm so grateful that those are the plumbers that I learned from. Yeah. I remember I had a problem in the union and me and another guy, the guy ended up trying to file charges on me, went before the superintendent. And superintendent listened to everybody's bitch and moan and complain and whatnot. And he finally looked at the other guy and says, so, so how's this work? I Man, a guy just put his head down. He said, look, I can't complain about his work. It's true, plumb and square. It's perfect. We never have a problem. We never have to come back and fix it. He said, so if you file charges or you run him off like you're trying to do, and he goes to work for our competitor, does he make them better? He put his head down again. He said, yeah, he does. 
he says, so can we just agree that y'all have got personal differences that, that we can work on? Guy's like, yeah. So, I mean, and, and the guy's a great guy. Yeah. And, you know, he had some valid problems. I was a smart ass. Mm-hmm. But learning from the people I did, I mean, when I first walked in the union, you know, you're a rat. They've got, a, they got names for you. Yeah. You're a rat. You don't know anything. You don't know how to plumb. You're open shop. You never learn the right way. And I made it my goal every day. I'm going to be the best plumber on this job. Whatever job I'm on, I'm going to do the best work. We're not going to have to fix my stuff. I don't have leaks. It's going to be done right each and every day. So I do. I love that attitude, that yeah. mindset. Tell everybody who you are and, and, and what you do. I'm Joe Ferno Wetter. I mean, I've done HVAC now for 13 years. I've been a mechanic, a tinkerer, a fixer my whole life. I, I think the first thing I took apart, uh, my dad's drill. I was probably five or six years old, and I don't know. And there was a drill there. There was a screwdriver. <laughs> I, I saw that the shape matched that shape and, you know, uh, took it apart. I don't know why. I put it back together, and it worked. I, I remember my dad being so mad. Like, I, for one, I touched something that wasn't mine. Yeah. And I was, you know, taking his stuff apart. Why was I doing that? I don't know. I was just curious about what was inside of it, I guess. And I, I think he was pretty impressed that, like, I put it back together and it still worked. I've just always fixed things. I, uh, I, I have, I guess, a, I feel like I have a, an engineering and mechanic mindset. I've always really enjoyed it. You know, fixing things is kind of like Legos. I love Legos. I did motorcycle mechanics for, I mean, heck, I still do them. I mean, I've been doing motorcycle mechanics over 20 years. I thought motorcycles was what I was going to do. You know, I was in a, a, a really crappy shop but I think was the best place for me to be. Mm-hmm. And I think it'd be really great for anybody to start in the type of shop that I did. We fix things that no one else would work on. Dealerships wouldn't work on it. Too old, parts not available. Guy that I worked for was really more of a hoarder with motorcycle parts and things. Um, he he wanted to be a salvage yard. And in, in the years that I worked there, we kind of turned it into that. I wanted something better after being there for a while. And that's when I went to school. I tried dealerships and, you know, they wanted credentials. They didn't care how good you were. They wanted paper to send mm-hmm. you. you yeah, they wanted proof. Yeah. And, um, and it was, it was funny. I, like I even told the guy, I said, man, go get the best tech that you've got here. Your, your shop manager, whoever it is, service manager, and let him talk to me for 10 minutes and he'll know I know what I'm talking about. And he was like, well, you know, that I, I get you there. He goes, but here's the thing. He's like, we're a dealership. We do warranty work. We do bikes out of crate. You got to build them. He goes, I can't charge the manufacturer the same labor rate for a certified tech for the manufacturer, you know, as just somebody. So it doesn't matter how good you are. He goes, you don't have those credentials you bet. To, to prove it. He said, so you need to go to school. He said, if you come back and you have the credentials, you know, from that manufacturer, he goes, then I can give you X an hour. And um, I said, all right, great. So I, I went to school. And then um, I ended up, instead of going just for one manufacturer, I went for the whole school. So like most people go to that trade school for a year. I was there for three. Yeah. Um, I had a vision then where I thought, I don't want to just have one manufacturer. I want to have all these that they offer. And then I thought, you know, I'm going to open my own shop. And, you know, my vision was to have like all of the stuff on the wall, all my certifications. That way, if anybody walked in, they didn't care if it was a Harley, a Suzuki or whatever. Um, they go, oh man, this guy's good. He's got all this stuff. Mm-hmm. Then I found out ha- uh, halfway through school that you don't get certified through school, which is, that was frustrating to like yeah. find out like you get sold this, this, uh, you know, bag of goods from the, the, the recruiter, I guess you would say. Um, and then they're not right. So that, that was really, uh, a big letdown. I actually tried to get out of the school, but then I was already into the financing for it. I was gonna have to pay for it either way. Mm-hmm. So I just kept going. So it really stunk there was that I ended up with what I thought was going to be all these certifications and they're just certificates of dealer training. You bet. I had the shop hours, but I didn't have the shop hours for that dealer. The way that it worked is like you had to go spend X amount of time with each dealer and it's hard to have all those dealers in one building. You know, either where do they sell? Yeah, they're not in one. No, they don't sell Honda and Harleys. No, they don't want, they don't want to be together. No, like you, you'll get two of them together. I, I, I actually almost worked for one that was three and one, which is great because I didn't understand, you know, demographics and, you know, w- w- what market you're looking at for, you know, things when I first started it, because 
if I'd have known what I know now, I wouldn't have even went to the other classes. I went straight to Harley. You know, if you're playing with motorcycles, that's where the money is. Oh yeah. You know, I mean, the demographic of who owns a sport bike versus who owns a Harley, you know, is completely different. And even if somebody that owns a Harley, even if they don't have money for anything else in life, they have it for that Harley. Oh yeah. I wish I'd have just done Harley in retrospect, but I'm glad I did the program, but I was disappointed at the outcome, you know, for the money you're spending for the trade school. And I didn't get what I was going for. Um, so anyways, I did custom motorcycles. I was always tinkering with custom stuff for a long time. And, um, I ended up in a custom bike shop, got to do a lot of cool stuff. I mean, I've got bikes that people freak out when they see them, got bikes in magazines. Um, I I love it. When I go back and look at some of those pictures and think of what I built, it, it was a lot of fun. But then my friend who never, I think, Man, since the age of 16, maybe he worked at like Hungry Howie's for a year, you know, doing pizza. But after that, I don't think that boy ever had a job more than probably six months or so. He had a crappy attitude and he just, I don't know, just didn't like to do stuff. I don't know. Anyway, so when I got into the the bike thing, he had just started HVAC. And he's like, dude, you need to quit that school and come do this. And I'm making all this money. You know, it's the best money I've ever made. It's a great company. He's like, man, you get to do this and this and this. And he's like, I feel good. I get to help people every day. And I'm like, man, that sounds awesome. I bet like, you're on your path. I'm on mine. I said, look, man, if that gig is really that good, it'll always be there. You bet. I was like, people's air conditioners, they're plumbing, they're electric, they're roofs. We're always going to have these things mm-hmm. in our homes. So when the bike thing wasn't working out, um, you know, the shop I was working for ended up kind of closing down, you know, um, the, uh, the owner really wasn't running it right. And, uh, I looked at a few other shops around, just wasn't feeling. And I kept looking at the HVAC thing and, you know, I'm just talking to him and he's progressively making more money every year. He's just getting better at what he's doing. You know, I kind of looked at him like, well, I can play with bikes in the garage. I can provide better for my family this way, depending on what the economy is doing. The economy is bad. People aren't customizing their motorcycles. But they still have to have their air conditioner. You bet. They have to have their heater. They have to have their plumber. They have to have a roof on their house. They have to have electricity. These are things that it doesn't matter what's going on in the world. You still have to have these things. So then I started looking like, okay, uh, if I can do this and I like it, then I can play with bikes in my garage. So I went, um, worked for the company there in Florida, really good company, and I got lucky because... If it wasn't, I think, for him, and I don't even know how he found this place, if I didn't go there, I, who knows? I got lucky and started at a great company. Isn't that amazing? I just got lucky, you know. Um, the uh, started at a great company. They were doing things the right way. They had a great reputation, and it's because they did things the right way. And that's how I learned. And I was kind of thrown to the wolves a little bit. My direct manager, my, my field supervisor, hardly ever answered the phone. I don't know if he was doing it on purpose because maybe he thought, okay, this, this guy's going to figure it out, you bet. you know, or he just, I don't, I don't know, maybe he just didn't care. I don't know, but it worked out great for me. I mean, with all of my mechanical, you know, background, um, the, the school that I went to, um, just, I put everything together and so much of it made sense. I was able to relate a lot of the things with age back to things that I already understood. Man, I just, I did really well. I was in a leadership position, I think before I even hit my 90 day probationary period, you know, I had the GM of the company come ask me, Hey, uh, will you please, you know, go for this field service manager position? I was thinking, dude, like, I've not been here long enough. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I don't know enough. He's like, man, he's like, from what I've seen, you know, you're the right person. And it's more important that I have the right person in the position than what the person knows. You bet. He said, I, I can't make somebody that has all the knowledge in, in the world in this you know, field and be the right person. He said, you're the right person. He's like, we can give you the knowledge. And, um, man, I, uh, I would have stayed there, but you know, life brought me to Texas, which, uh, I was reluctant to come, did not want to leave Florida and the beaches and my family and friends, but I, I came here. I really like it. And, you know, now I've, I've got new friends. I still go back and see my others and my family. And, um, you know, I've, I've built a, a life and family here. That's great. And again, I got extremely lucky, um, you know, to, to have luck strike twice in this, you know, the same field. When I came here and started with rescue air and met, you know, uh, Josh and Michael, 
I have never in my life had things line up so well. You know, I was uh, coming from a small market to this big, huge market. You bet. You know, and I'm like, hey, man, dude, you're you're in your your mid 30s or so. I mean, I didn't feel old, but I'm like, I'm also not super young. Like, and I didn't want to spend the next five years or more bouncing around, you know, trying to find what felt like home. Because then what now, what, I'm 40 and you know, you've worked at five different places and, you know, it just doesn't look good. So I'm like, man, I'm a little nervous. My boss down there, you know, we were part of, you know, the the same network with all the the outside training mm-hmm. that uh, that Rescuer does, like with Nexstar and SGI. And, you know, I wanted that same thing. I wanted the the, the dealer training, you know, um, the, the ethics training, all of that. I just really liked it, especially when you go to some of the part houses and see some of your competition some of the shady characters I, there i would not let that dude in my house with me there let alone with me not there you know like trying to think like man that guy would walk in at service you know my home and my wife's sitting there to let him in there ain't no way in the service industry that that's a thing it's a real thing you know normally the guys are going to be at work and say honey look can you stay home can you can you take care of this it's not always that way so it's nothing against women yeah but we have to look at everybody we hire. Oh yeah, and say, wait, would I send? And I used to do this all the time. Would I send this person into a house with my mother or my sister? Yep. The answer is no, more than it's yes. Yeah. And I mean, I hate to say that, but you look at a lot of people, and it's like, you know, I would not want this person around my mother or my sister in the middle of the day with with nobody else there. We're getting judged all the time. Mm-hmm. I mean, and not even at work, just all the time. <laughs> people are always looking at people and critiquing what they're doing, how they're doing it. You know, so everything from the way that our people answer the phones, you know, that's the first one. You bet. Depending on how good that phone call goes, that's going to set the stage for what's expected, you know, for the rest of the dealings with our company. You know, and then how do we pull up? Do we pull up on the right side of the road or do we just pull on the other side of the road because it was more convenient than driving past us, turning around? Or worse, one of my pet peeves, and man, I just want to shake people when they do it, when they pull up against traffic and park on the the wrong side of the road. You, bet. you know, they're right in front of the house. But it's man, great for them. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's not. They're, they're I know. Just, they don't think. like So yeah, it's you pulled up. It was easy for you, right? But most of the time you're getting your stuff out of the passenger side and you're standing in traffic. Like you didn't even protect yourself. Like you're just not thinking. You know, if I saw a service person come up to my house or anything and they just pulled up and parked the wrong way in front of my house, I may or may not let them in the door and I'm probably not doing business with them no matter what. Just because like, I'm like, to me, you're not a thinker. You either don't care or you just don't think. And it drives me nuts. Like if you're going to, if you don't think about just something that simple, then are you going to think, like you said, are you going to turn my pipes the right way? Are you going to care how things look, you know? I want it to work good, but I want it to look good too, you know? So yeah, we're, we're critiqued on everything we do, how we park, you know, how long does it take us to get out of the truck? How do we look walking up? You know, I mean, we, we, we can't choose, you know, our body shape for most of us, you bet, <laughs> you know, our height, uh-huh. you know, our, our skin. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're not overweight. We're, no. we're, we're, we're hot challenge. Correct. So, I mean. The, the thing that we do have control over with our personal appearance is, are we groomed? You know, are our uniforms tidy? Heck, do we have a uniform? Mm-hmm. You know? Um, do we brush, brush our teeth? Oh, do we smell like a cigarette? Oh, gosh, that's the worst. You know, you could, you could have all the right things to say. They can love you, but if they're smelling the cigarette, they're uh-huh. not going to want to listen. Yes. All they're thinking is, is how quick can he get out of my house? Mm-hmm. But for all those little things, you know, that's how I learned. I was trained in this industry about to be mindful of all of that. And, um, when I came here, it it was, it was so crazy. I thought I was going to have this list of like 20 or 30 places to go interview with. And I mean, I I told my boss there about six months prior that I was moving here and he was kind of taken back. Like no one had ever given him that type of heads up. He said, don't worry, I'll find you a place. And it literally came to a few days before I was coming here because my plan was to come here, you know, spend a few weeks, find it, find a job and, uh, go back home, work my last two weeks and then come bring all my stuff. So I was taking two trips when it came down to, it was like Wednesday or Thursday and I'm leaving Friday right after work. It was one name on the list. 
it was the only company that fit my criteria. Now I looked in Plano, um, cause I didn't know anywhere else. I just knew we were moving to Plano. So let's look for something in Plano. And, um, it was so crazy when I'm listening to, you know, my boss at the time, tell me everything about this company and how good it is and all the reasons they started the company. And I joked with them and I said, Hey man, what's this place called? You know, uh, air rescue. He's like, no, it's rescue air. So I worked for air rescue in Florida. Oh, that's funny. And it was a great company. I loved everything about it. And I, I, I just wanted to make, you know, a lateral move. I didn't want to step back. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to go through several different companies to kind of, you know, find home. And when I, when he's telling me everything is so good, just like, all right, where's the catch here? Yeah. I'm like, this sounds like just like it is. True. Yeah. And you know, when <clears throat> it was just a flip of the name, that's um, cool. it was awesome. And then the first person I met was, uh, was Michael. And what was cool is where we're sitting there. And when I was, uh, married before, uh, my now ex-wife, she, uh, she's looking at the reviews. She goes, man, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if I got a good feeling about this. I said, well, why, why is that? She's like, these reviews are great. And I'm like, yeah, I know. That's like, I'm excited to go here. She's like, no, like they're almost too great. She goes, I think they're writing the reviews. I said, really? Why do you say that? She goes, because they're all so good. Like I can't find any bad ones. And she's like, they're kind of saying all the same things. I'm like, I mean, well, doesn't that show you consistency? She's like, yeah, I get it. But she's like, like, there's gotta be some bad ones. And I said, well, I got reviews like that back home. <laughs> she's like, yeah, I know, but there are also some bad ones. I'm like, well, yeah, we're also a bigger company. I'm like, there's like three or four people over there right now. I remember meeting Michael and within the first like five or 10 minutes, I'm like under the table texting. I'm like, yeah, the reviews are real. This guy's great. <laughs> I was like, this, this is going to be really good. And then I met Josh and it was just more of the same. And then I, you know, met the other people at the office and it was just great. I've, uh, I'd never had anything in my life line up so well to tell me that's where you should be. So you got, no, okay. And go back my pet peeve. Yeah. Parking in front of the mailbox. Gosh, I will get upset and my technicians, I ever pull up to a job and see that I'm like, dude, this, this lady may be waiting on her social security chair, you know? Don't, don't mess up our day. Well, heck man, you've heard people say, you know, man, they went postal. Yeah. yeah. You're trying to have nobody go postal on me. Yeah. But yeah, I like that. I, I like that. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, come on, man. Just, just be mindful of what you're doing. I'm assuming you got HVAC because that's what your buddy did. Yeah. Got you a job at the same company. Yep. Did you ever think about plumbing, electrical, roofing, any of that? Or as soon as you got into HVAC, so you're like, I, and this is it. I did roofing, man, roofers, they're a different breed. We all are. Yeah. Um, what was crazy with roofing and really what turned me off was the guy I worked for. You know, if I had worked for a better company, who knows? I, I might still be doing roofing right now. I probably wouldn't be doing the roof anymore. Maybe it'd be, you know, doing consultations and selling roof jobs. But um, yeah, I did roofing for maybe a month. And what I liked about it, I mean, what, what's great about our trade is, or, or the, the trades in general is, if you like to fix things, if you like, you know, you like that, that sense of, of accomplishment, you know, it's not the same thing every single day where you, you feel like you never get anywhere. Like you're just treading water every day at work here. You're, you're having victories all day, every day, and you're helping people. And, uh, you know, you're taking things that are messed up and you're, you're, you're making them good again. So what was cool about roofing, you know, you go to a house, I mean, it needs a roof because it's crap. It, you know, you're not pulling off a good roof to put on another good roof. That's also the sketchy part of it. You're on a crappy roof that's not safe. And, um, you know, when you're on single story roofs, not that big of a deal. Heck, I used to jump off roofs. Who cares? You know, um, some crazy pitches. Okay, whatever. I'm still, you know, one story off the ground, not a big deal. You start getting on two story roofs and things start changing. And um, the guy that I worked for didn't care about safety. You know, um, he viewed safety as slowing us down. Mm -hmm. And I remember, you know, he was kind of getting on me about, I was working slow and I was like, well, dude, I mean, if I hit that ground, it's not going to end well, you know? And he's like, oh man, just, you know, whatever, whatever. Just don't think about it. And I'm like, yeah, the fall isn't bad at all. It's yeah, the, the stop at the bottom. Yeah. Dude, I'm telling you, I love heights, but I know, and it's never happened, but I know I don't like hitting that damn ground. Yeah. 
I was saying something one time about, man, at this height, I mean, shouldn't we be tied off or something? I was like, is there like, there should, should be like some type of harness or something. I know nothing. I was, I was young. He's like, yeah, yeah, I got the harnesses. I'm like, harness? What do you mean harnesses? He's like, oh, well, when we break open the roof here, we tie them off up here. And if you slip, it's like a seatbelt. And I'm like, why the hell are we not using these? And he's like, oh man, they slow you down. I'm like, dude, you don't give a shit about your people. Yeah. So I, I, I quit him. Um, and then something about, you know, laying on the edge of a house, two stories up, trying to put drip red or drip rail on or whatever. Yeah. yeah. You're laying head down like yeah. you could slide off at any yeah. 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 So um, I've done it. There was a, a part of it I liked, but I didn't like it enough to want to keep doing it. Electrical. I never really thought about doing it in a house, but I, I, I've ran a lot of electric, you know, I've ran a lot of cable. I don't know. I just never thought of doing it as a profession. I think after the roofing deal and um, some of the things I've done um, with the electrical, like m my best friend, his father owned an exporting company and he would send car parts to South America. And we would, we basically had a legal chop shop, um, but he did all kinds of other things. You know, he uh, was, you know, building offices on his property out of trailers and we'd have to rip apart electrical, rerun it, whatever. So, I mean, I, I've kind of, have done all of it in, to some degree. I've never done like electrical in a house, like wiring from, uh, you know, the frame up or anything, but I've ran electrical circuits, dropped them down walls, moved them. Um, but I never, I never thought about doing it as a profession. Um, and then I, I, I went out of that, uh, what you call it? The, um, the chop shop type deal mm -hmm. that I was talking about. That's when I went into to motorcycle shortly after that. And then that led me to school and then my friend. And so, yeah, I'd never really thought about the, the, the trades before then. If he was doing plumbing, maybe I'd be a plumber right now. I don't know. No, I get it. Cause my best friend was a plumber. Yeah. Told me one night we're working together in a, in a burger joint and it was a slow night and we were sitting wow. around talking and he asked me, so you going to do this forever? I'm like, dude, I'm 16. I'm managing a hamburger place. Life is good. And he's like, yeah, but. What's going to happen if you ever quit or get fired? Who's going to hire a 16-year-old kid? Yeah. Well, we went on that night to talk about his father and his three brothers that were all plumbers, and they loved what they did. They, some of them were service plumbers. Some of them were construction plumbers. So they built or, or repaired things every day, and they made good money, and they had their own apartments and houses and this and that. A couple of weeks later, I either quit or probably got fired yeah. and ended up calling one of his brothers. It was middle of my junior year, but I'd quit school. So I called one of his brothers and he got me a job and loved it. I mean, I was like, okay, this is cool. And I'm doing a big plumbing remodel, adding on to a Wells Fargo. So it's part construction, part service, because you're mm -hmm. tying into a lot of the old stuff. And I was just like, man, I love this. This is a lot of fun. And luckily one of my ex-girlfriends were talking one time and she says, you know, I could probably never marry anybody that didn't graduate high school. Went back to high school, graduated with my class, and the rest is history, plumbing history. That's cool that you got into it that early. It, it is. I, I mean, I, I started when I was 16 years old. I lied to get my first job. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I, I literally, I, I wanted a job, and, and here I am. And back then, you know, you talk about safety. They gave us hard hats. They gave us glasses. They gave us gloves. And we'd go up the floor, take it off, and put it aside, and put it on right before you come back down at yeah. the end of the day. Yeah. Uh, it, it, safety stuff, but it just all got in the way. Yeah. And, you know, safety's changed a lot, which, which is good. Yeah. We don't have near as many people die on the jobs every day. You want your safety stuff to get you do. away. You, you do. <laughs> you want you do. It. It's, it's going to save your life, trust me. What made you want to become great? What made you be, want to become a great technician? Because I worked around some great plumbers growing up, so I, I was like, yeah, look, I'm never going to be as good as them. But then when I walked in the union and they treated me the way that, that I, that they did, I'm just like, hold my beer and watch this. Let me show you what I can do. What made you want to become great? I don't know if I ever really thought about it that way. What made you want to be the best? What made you want to do work better than everybody else there? The furthest back I could think, I, there was a bicycle I wanted. And it was funny, you know, um, I would ask for this bicycle all the time. You know, my neighborhood growing up was in three sections and it just got wealthier as you went along. And we were not even anything considered wealthy. Like we were in the lowest end of it. And, um, you know, then we would ride our bikes 
over and kind of like go to the park and then maybe we'd go to the next neighborhood a little bit better park and then the kids had better bikes and then you know so on the uh i remember seeing everybody had this one bike and i'm like man that thing is so slick and you know we're jumping ramps and doing things and i could do better tricks than a lot of the other kids and i'm on this crappier bike but i ended up breaking my bike doing some of those tricks sometimes i'm bringing mm-hmm. home you know the wheels bent because i did some 360 off this ramp or whatever it was and i'd plead with my parents that I wanted the better bike. I'd never get it. But every Christmas, I'd get a new bike, a new crappy bike. You know, it was a great bike if you were just riding it. You bet. But I'm doing all these tricks and crazy things. I need a bike that's built for what I'm trying to do. And I remember pleading with my parents, you know, and they're like, oh, that bike's a lot of money. And, I mean, we're talking, I was probably started at 11 or 12 asking for this bike. Mm -hmm. And every year I'd bike, well, listen, you know, like, I get all these presents from everybody. I'm like, can you not talk to like grandma, grandpa, uncle, aunt, you know, and can everybody like pitch together and just get me this dang bike? You bet. Like, I don't care about the 15 other crappy things that are like going to hit me that I don't use. Um, I just want this one thing. Never happened, never happened. And then finally, I think I was, I was about 14. I, I asked again for it. And my dad looked at me and goes, you know what? You want that damn bike so bad. He said, you see that lawnmower over there? I was like, yeah. He goes, the first tank of gas is on me. Check the oil every day before you go take it out. He goes, start cutting grass. Make some money. Go buy that damn bike if that's what you want. I remember going down to the, uh, just dragging the thing, you know, through the neighborhood and, you know, see a house and they, they need their grass cut. I remember the first time I uh, I was cutting the grass and it was tall, man. And like, I had to cut it so much and I didn't price it right. And, you know, I could have just said, screw it. And left because uh, this wasn't paying me enough. But I just remember looking, like, after I mowed it, it looked like crap. I had mohawks and clumps of grass. And, dude, I was dragging a lawnmower. I didn't have a rake and a blower and a weed eater and an edger and all this crap. So I just mowed the grass probably, like, three or four times till it looked like it was mowed last week. And I had just done it. Yep. You know, and um, I remember thinking, man, I only got, like, ten bucks for this yard this is nuts. But I, I knew it looked bad when I was done and I didn't want my work to look bad. So I don't remember really ever being taught, you know, about taking pride and doing anything. Um, I don't remember any of those life lessons. I just remember me looking at what I just did and I'm like, well, that didn't look too much better than when I first got here other than it's shorter. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I thought, well, crap, if I had to mow it three or four times, it should be three or four times the cost. Right. So the next house I went to, I looked for the same type of house. And I went and hit that guy up. I'm like, hey, yeah, it's going to be like $45. And he's like, what? To cut the grass? I said, well, man, no one's been cutting it for a long time. So, I mean, uh, you've been saving the money. You know, this is at 14, you know, trying, you trying to, 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 to deal. I cut that grass. And it was funny. So I told him, I was like, look, you're going to pay me 45 today. I'm going to cut it. It's going to look like I cut it last week. I say, and then I'm going to come back next week. And it's going to be 15. And I'll just come back every week and it'll be 15. I said, and when we get to the winter, you know, maybe I'll come every other couple of weeks. All right. Did it. Did a great job. Now I have that contract, right? You bet. Um, and I just kept doing that, doing that, doing that. I made so much stinking money that summer. I remember, I'll never forget going into that store to buy that bike. But now I could buy the better bike. I never even thought the better bike was on my radar. And I went in and we look at it. And uh, the bike I was looking at was a Dyno VFR. Um, I'm an 80s kid, so that was a 90s bike. And um, the GT Performer was like, that was like the shit. Like, I didn't even think I'd ever own one of those. And I remember going in the store and I had all this money and I look at the bike. And my mom's like, which which one's the one you want? I told her that one. She's like, all right, well, you know, which color are you going to get? I'm like, I'm not getting that one. She's like, well, but that's what you wanted. I said, no, I'm getting that one right there. And she's like, really? I'm like, yeah, that thing's awesome. She's like, do you have the money for it? I'm like, yes, I do. She's like, all right, if that's what you want to do. So I'd go tell the guy, I'm like, hey, I want that bike right there. He's like, okay. And then I said, but I don't want those wheels. I said, I want those wheels. He's like, well, they don't come with those wheels. Okay, I want them. Yeah. You know, he's like, uh, well, those wheels are like a couple hundred dollars. I said, okay, well, those wheels I don't want, so how about you put those wheels on the bike and you can keep those other wheels and you can give me this credit. 
and here's this 14 year old kid like haggling you bet with the guy kind of deal. deal that he looks at my mom like for approval she's like yeah this, this is his deal um so i ended up taking the bike home and dude i was like the envy of the neighborhood everybody was like holy crap dude look at his bike and like i, I was so proud that you know i went from wanting this and wanting somebody else to get it for me to then my dad tell me to go earn it and he showed me a small way to be able to go do that and then there was just something in me that just wanted to do really good at what I did. I did really good at what I did. And I was able to get better than what I thought I could get. Mm -hmm. And then that turned into like, <laughs> I mean, I went to school the next year. I mean, with better clothes than I'd ever went to school with. Isn't that neat? And I, I just felt so much better about myself. Yes. And um, I mean, I had an awesome stereo that pissed my neighbors off. Um, you know, I remember thinking, you know, Circuit City, man, that place ain't been around forever, right? Mm -hmm. And like you'd go in there and go into the stereo rooms and, and this is way before Best Buy. And I always wanted like a cool stereo. You know, you grow up, you see your uncles. My uncles had cool stereos and like I wanted to have what they had or better. I remember like I had enough money. I put it like on layaway, whatever. So I'd go cut my grass and go you every week and make payments, make payments. I remember, man, I we had to figure out, thank God my mom had a minivan back in the day. Like I had these big Sir Win Vegas speakers, 15s. You know, uh, the, the regular stereo with a big old amp and all this stuff. And I don't know, man, it felt good when I wanted all these things before I couldn't have them or get them. And then I found out, okay, I can work and I can, you know, earn and I can get what I want. And uh, I don't know, I think ever since then, I just, everything I did, I wanted to do it as good as I could do it. I never wanted to be wrong. I would read manuals. Crazy concept, right? Yeah, we're yeah. men. We don't do that. Yeah, yeah. you know. Yeah, screw up a, a, enough things. And yeah, you know, you'll, you'll get a red out, damn yeah. chapter. You'd be like, oh, okay, I see. So this screw that's half an inch longer didn't go yeah. out there. Exactly. Um, <laughs> you know, I uh, no wonder I had to force it to make it fit. Oh, God. Well, what's bad is when you don't force it and you're just screwing it because you're using power. Just, and it pushes right through the backside. Yeah. yeah. And uh, But, yeah, I've, I've done that enough. Uh, but, yeah, reading the manuals. You know, not thinking or worrying about, did somebody else tell me, you know, right? Because I had, you know, a few people tell me wrong along Ooh. the way. And um, the uh, the first motorcycle that I rebuilt, um, I I wasn't working a speed well before I went to school. I uh, had some few odds and ends jobs and just, I just didn't really, I wasn't working for good people. I had actually went through bankruptcy like super young. Like I was like 20 something. I'd worked for this, this person that put me in a really bad financial position. Um, the, uh, it was just crazy. Anyways, um, the only thing I had left was my motorcycle and I'm going through bankruptcy and they're telling me like, Hey, look, you have this allotment for your vehicle, anything over you need to come up with. I'm like, I don't have anything. This is why I'm right. bankrupt right now. Yeah. You know, and um, I thought, well, the bike wasn't running very good because I was out of town for a while, carbureted. I'm like, you know what? Took it all apart. Took pictures of it all apart. And I went and asked, uh, when the guy told me the allotment, I went to the dealership. I was like, hey, man, how much would y'all give me for this type of bike? He's like, oh, we'd have to see it. I said, well, I mean, I can't really bring it up here. It's all on pieces. pieces. And he's like, what? And I showed him all the pictures. He's like, man, we wouldn't even give you $1,000. Can you please write that up? So he gave me a, a formal written estimate for the pieces of the bike at like 800 bucks, which got me to keep my bike. And then I'm sitting there, no job. I got to put it back together. And that was my only transportation. Then I had to put it back together. And it already wasn't running well. So kind of looked at the miles like, yeah, you know what? I want to customize this. So I went to the manufacturer, got the factory manual, and literally went cover to cover. Every single thing, you know, on that bike was redone, you know, by the factory manual. So all the tolerances for rebuilding the whole motor, everything. I customized it. I uh, I sat in my mother's tub with the frame. The uh, <laughs> I sat in her tub. I, I like sanded the whole frame. I got the bike from a buddy and he like tried to customize it. And like when he wanted to take all the coatings off the metal and polish everything out, he did it with the bike together. 
used aerosol stripper. I mean, there were things stripped behind the scenes that you couldn't see. Right. And it just it was sloppy. And when I took it apart, like I realized how much everything just looked really bad. And I'm like, well, if I'm taking it apart, this is the time to do it. I mean, I went sanded that frame in, in the tub, hand polished everything, got the bike back together. It rode phenomenal. Better than it had ever ridden. And I was like, holy crap. Like, I couldn't believe how much better it was. And I remember one time going to, uh, I went to get some parts from a, a shop I'd never been to. And the owner of that shop saw my bike. And, you know, he's talking, he's like, man, that looks really good. And he's like, man, what is it? I'm like, man, dude, this guy owns a motorcycle shop and didn't know what my bike was. Right. Because I had changed so much. I had shaved handles off of it, turned signals, different things. I had put a different front end on the bike from a, a, a newer generation. And he's like, that's a Kawasaki. And I'd even taken like, uh, like the, <laughs> so my, my stator cover was scraped up and I didn't have the money to buy a new one. So I literally took JB Weld and like filled in the scrapes. And I'm like, you know what, while I'm filling in the scrapes, the, the part, part, part of the Kawasaki was a little scraped too. So I, I, I filled in that as well. And what was actually pretty cool is the part where the Kawasaki was, was the, the, the deepest that I had filled it in with JB Weld. And after I'd ride the bike, it would heat up differently than the aluminum of that cover. And you could see it like a ghost image where it said Kawasaki. And then when it cool. cooled back down, you couldn't see it. Um, that was pure luck, I guess, uh, that, that was kind of cool. But anyways, that's how I got my first bike job, uh, working as a mechanic. That guy saw that bike and he's like, you know, at first he asked me, he's like, <laughs> yeah. you know, what shop did you take this to? And the bike was primer. Um, but I had wet sanded the primer cause I couldn't afford a paint job. My bike, would, that bike then would have been so popular now with all these matte oh, yeah. dishes and these flat gray and the Nardo gray deal and whatever, which is basically like glossed primer mm -hmm. or flat primer. It's pretty much what it looked like. So my bike was way ahead of the curve That's fun. back then. And uh, man, I got so many compliments on it. And when I told him, I was like, you know, I did the work. And he's like, oh man, do you have a shop? I was like, no. I did this in my mom's garage. She's like, man, you got all these tools? I'm like, no. It was all, all by hand. I didn't have a, 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 a orbital sander. I mean, I yeah. sanded it with a block in my hand, you know, and he's like, holy crap. So he offered me a job. And then I was there for the three years that didn't work out. And then I ended up going to the school and so on. I think like going through the manual and reading the specs and the tolerances and figuring out how to measure everything and doing everything really factory right. When I saw how well that, the 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 bike was better than I'd ever had it, and I got it from a shop, right? Mm -hmm. um, After they had gone through and made it right, right, correct. I was like, holy crap, you know. So then, I think then that was in wait oh three, so that was twenty three. That's when I was like, okay. From that point, I think everything that I did, I read the manual because I saw that when it was done right, how much better it was. I didn't know how good that bike could be mm -hmm. when I got it. I was, I was a novice. I'd never ridden a motorcycle. You know, I bought my first bike and took off down the road, did about 150 and had the adrenaline rush and talked my buddy into buying that bike. I ended up selling the other and then got his cause he stopped riding it. And to me, they both rode great cause I didn't know any better. Right. I'd never ridden a brand new bike. They were both used, you, bet. you know, so I didn't realize how good that bike could ride until it was set up properly. Not what somebody thought was good, what the manufacturer said mm -hmm. is right. So when it was manufactured right, oh my gosh, it felt like a new motorcycle. Um, I, I couldn't believe how, how big of a difference everything was, you know, setting the valve clearances, you know, getting them dialed in, synchronizing the carburetors, going through all of it and just make sure it was right. So then, I mean, Ever since then, I mean, who's going to know more right than the person that built it? So then everything I did, I read manuals, read manuals, read manuals. And when I got into HVAC, you know, um, I didn't have the support of that team lead to call and help me figure something out. Okay, what I do? I Google, you know, the manual. Go through the troubleshooting of the manual. Who's going to teach me better than the person that built it? Mm -hmm. So then I just, I kind of stopped relying on other people and I would just go through the manual. So then... A lot of what I've done, I've taught myself 
out of the manual, which is another thing that I really loved about Rescue Air and doing factory training. So like we'll go to Linux, we'll go to Carrier every so often, you know, and, and do training there. Or we'll have people come in and do training with us. So um, I like that all of the knowledge that we've been given has been from the source, mm -hmm. not what somebody else's interpretation of, of right. knowledge was. Yeah, I'm going to teach you how to work on every HVAC system there is. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think you need that to a degree. You bet. It's going to teach you the fundamentals. The fundamentals. Refrigerant, how's it flow? Correct. Pressures, all, all kinds yeah, of cool stuff. They, they work on the same principles. You bet. You know, that hasn't been reinvented. You know, there's there's more technology now, you know, and, and how does each manufacturer do something just a little different? You know, those little things. But, uh, yeah, I think um, wanting to do things right after seeing how much better something was when it was done right. And then wanting to know, not wanting to trust somebody else's, you know, thoughts on it. So how do you use that now? Because look, you, you have a reputation for being a great technician, a great salesperson, a great communicator. How do you take everything you've got to make you one of the best HVAC people probably in the Dallas area right now? I've never thought that way of myself, but over the past several years, I've heard it said to me a lot. Mm -hmm. And now more than ever, I really can't be wrong. You know, it's a, it's a big weight to put on your shoulders. Yeah. And I, I don't, I don't think about it, uh, think about it a lot, but I mean, we're talking about it now. Absolutely. And every once in a while. And we never think about things the way I talk about them. Yeah. Because I'm trying to get our listener, our viewer to understand, look, you can be the very best if you want to. You, you can. Anybody can. You can have what you want if you're going to do what it takes to get it. Mm -hmm. You know, um, the uh, you got to put in the work um, and, and think about it. I don't think there's a lot of people that are thinkers. There's a lot of people that just kind of do maybe what they're told or maybe just what they see somebody else do. And I don't think a lot of people stop and think. I think I've realized this more in the past few years having kids. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like we start to like, uh, my daughter, we're, we're doing her, her uh, flashcards for school, right? And she just wants to guess at everything. She doesn't want to actually read. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh my gosh, read it. Like you can do this. You know how to sound things out. You just, you just want to guess. Like you don't. You're not trying to learn. Like, I'm like, sweetie, we, we got to learn here. You know, I was like, the better you are at learning, the smarter you're going to be, the more opportunity you're going to have, and all of the things that you want, you're going to have a better chance at getting them. I was like, you can't try to memorize everything and just go through life guessing until you're right. Right. Like, about, back to the people telling me how good I am. I, I, I don't know that I ever sit there and think, oh, man, I'm this good or that. I'm confident. I, I know that I'm good at what I do because I know where I've gotten the knowledge. I love that. And it's been, you know, getting the knowledge from the right place. It's not, you know, what somebody else thought was right and I'm taking whatever they thought and then now that's my thought. You know, knowledge is, it's, man, it's powerful. When, when you have the right knowledge, I mean, what you can do with it. How many people do you see getting into the trades with that attitude? that want to learn the right way to do it each and every time. I don't see as many of them as I used to. Um, you know, when I was in a service manager role before, I dealt m more with those guys. You know, um, obviously I see them here and there at their shop. And, you know, we got a lot of guys with a lot of great attitude. And you, you, you can tell they, they want to know. Mm -hmm. You know, um, the ones that are getting into it. They last a lot longer. Oh, for sure. For sure. The, uh, you know, some of them, they go to school. Um, or they just come straight in. But, yeah, they, they want to know. And, and I see that they want the knowledge. They want to be right. Mm -hmm. um, I, I like that. You know, um, you get some guys that are super arrogant and and cocky. and They know everything. They can't learn anything else. Man, I tell you. I, <laughs> some of those guys. Wow. I had, there was a guy like that in, uh, in the motorcycle school. And now in the motorcycle school, Man, I hate to sound like I'm bragging, but it's just, it is what it is. 
So I was, I was the best person in the school for my period of time in that mm-hmm. school. Now, I was never the greatest student that didn't graduate on time. You know, um, I had to go back and get a GD. The, uh, when I went to motorcycle school at MMI, I'd already been doing motorcycles. I'd already taught myself out of that manual. I was going for credentials. Now, not to say I didn't learn because I no, didn't. No, you're going for certificates. You just didn't. Yeah, yeah you're right. See, I listened. Yeah, I listened. So, um, I, um, <clears throat> but I learned things there. I was a sharp tool that got sharper, but I, I kind of felt like a little bit like I was cheating in a way. Yeah, yeah, you knew the stuff. Yeah, it's like I was like I was the Spanish kid going to Spanish class. Yeah, but, but I went to school with some Spanish people that didn't. I, I spoke Spanish better than yeah. they did. Well, or or the difference. I mean, they're teaching you grammatical. Yes, no, no, no I, I not. no, I I went to school with Hispanics that could not speak Spanish. I'm like, yeah. don't your parents speak Spanish? And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, okay. And it's like, and you didn't learn. It's like, no, I never wanted to. It's like now you're sitting in class trying to learn it. Yeah. Well, I felt like the Spanish kid that knew Spanish that was taking the easy A. Yeah. Um, but I, I mean, um, I did really well in that class because I took English. I didn't make an easy A in there. You're right. <laughs> I mean, either. Um, the, um, but I'd already knew so much and had a lot of experience going to that school that I did really, really well. And they had awards for student of the course. I got it in every single course that I was in, um, which was awesome. But th- here I am, the one that you would think, you know, that was better than everybody would be the way the kid that knew hardly anything. Mm -hmm. Gosh, he drove me nuts. Like everybody just, you just want to shake this guy. No knowledge. You know, you're going to school to learn. Did he come in to learn or did he just come in to get a job? I don't don't, don't know. Like he seemed like he was passionate about it. I mean, most of the people that are going there, they're going there because they love motorcycles. And if they can make a living doing it, yeah, why not? Um, That's going to be great. I just don't know. I don't, I think when I look back now, I think like he was looking for acceptance, you know. That's a cool gig. Yeah. Yeah, If you're a Harley mechanic, do you? That's my guy right there. I think he, he wanted, he wanted the admiration, you know, he wanted people to look at him and, uh, he, he just, I think really just wanted to be liked. Uh, he was a little bit of a goofy kid that I think maybe was out of place probably everywhere else he was. Now he's surrounded by a lot of like people. And I think if he had just humbled himself and been cool, people would have liked him more. Mm -hmm. But he talked so much trash about how good he was. And I'm telling you, I wouldn't let that boy change a tire (laughs) on my bicycle, let alone a motorcycle. I like that. And what was crazy is going across the stage, I was so proud, man. I'd never done good in school. I didn't care. But now I cared about what I was doing. And I was the top person in the school. Um... The, uh, it was cool, you know, for my mom to watch me, you know, graduate there and to hear the things that the dean of that school said about me, Mm -hmm. like he didn't know me. What was neat was when he came to my file and he literally just said, Hey, stop, hold on. You guys are about to see somebody walk this stage that I've not seen anybody do this in the the 10, 15 years I've been in this school. That's cool. You know, this guy's got accolades and just boom, 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 boom. He's reading them all off. And man, it felt so, so good, you know? And when I walked there, seeing the, some, seeing that kid graduate, mm-hmm. you know, um, thinking, holy crap, you know, like he's going to work on somebody's motorcycle. I'm going to work on somebody's motorcycle. How would the homeowner know the difference? Mm-hmm. You know, um, I don't know, man, that that's the, the knowledge, wanting to do it right. Um, and realizing that there's people out there that just really don't. Yeah. You know, I went and, and I talked to high school students. I, I talked to, I, I talked to people every day or get messages from them that want to get into the trades and everybody thinks I can't get into the trade because I don't know anything about it. Or they think I'm too old. I think the old's going to help you. Actually, you know, when you go into people's houses, they're a little bit more mature. Yeah, people don't, they're, they're not going to want to listen to the, the 20 year old kid because he's too young. You can barely grow facial hair. I'm supposed to listen to you on what I need to do on my house. Mm-hmm. I'm a homeowner. I would, do, do you own a house? Right. In that situation, when you're young, you got to be extra sharp. You bet. Um, yeah. The older guy, I think actually has a lot more credibility 
he could have half the knowledge of the younger guy. And as long as he's confident talking to the homeowner, mm -hmm. I think that's going to be better received by most homeowners. Is the work too hard for somebody 30, 35 years old getting started? I'm 43 and it ain't, it ain't too hard. It's about me. when you got started. You got started, what, yeah, 28? I'm in there. Well, well 30. So There's 13 well, years. I, I don't I don't think it's too hard. I, I'll, I'll tell you, if it's HVAC, installs a tough gig. You I, know. I've interviewed a couple of them. They're, they're, they're having good years. And in, installs good, you know. Um, if if you, some people like the physically harder work. You bet. They like they it. feel like they do some every day. Yeah, I love that. The um, but they like they want it more physically challenging. You bet. They want to sit there all day and really, I mean, was real. Yes, moan growing. Yes. Yeah, that that that's a tough one. But I, I see guys that are forties doing it. If if you talk to somebody that's getting out of school right now and says. I'm thinking about getting into the trades. Number one, they don't know what trade they want. What would be your first recommendation there? The trades are great. They're they're pretty much recession proof. Sometimes I I think back and you know you look at some of the financial struggles that that other people have. Heck, I mean we go to customers' house and they have financial struggles. Absolutely, that I don't have. I'm what living, good, good way to look at. It. I'm living in the same world they are. I'm buying the same things they are. But my position didn't get laid off. My company didn't go to work from home. You know, um, my company doesn't have, or our, our industry doesn't have computers replacing us. You know, True. So when, uh, you know, sometimes we sit here and, you know, we, you, you kind of wonder, man, I can't believe they wouldn't just do this. Why would they keep repairing this old thing? And they're like, man, their money's tight. Why? Because of the, the job they do. Uh -huh. You know, um, I think. And we all have the opp same opportunity to get better. Uh, for, for, for sure. For sure. Oh, I think some people kind of look down a little bit on the trades. Oh, they do. Well, yeah, we're yeah, stupid. We're uneducated. Yeah. Yeah. Go fix your own air conditioner. Why'd you call me? Uh huh. Um, you know, go, go, go plunge your old toilet. Oh, you can't figure that out? See, trades are a great opportunity. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the, the, they really are. And I mean, the, uh, I, I think you could get into it at any age, you know. Okay. You've worked for two really good HVAC companies. Yeah. Anybody out there thinking about starting up their own business or they've already got a business that they're, they're not, they're not the best company. Mm -hmm. What would you tell somebody getting ready to become an owner or already an owner, but they really want a great company? Care more about your people than the money your people are bringing you. The, the more that you care about your people and they can feel and tell, then they're going to take better care of your company. If you're taking care of your people, then your people will take care of your customers. The customers are going to take care of your company. You bet. It's, Always. It's, it, it's so simple. It's so easy. I think sometimes we get wrapped up too much and, oh, we got to make this, we got to make that. And, you know, some companies are, you know, some owners are removed big, big companies own nationwide. I mean, everything's mm -hmm. just numbers and, you know, I, I get, you, you gotta have your, your KPIs, you know, um, you can't just blindly sail the ship, but I think the more that you take care of your people, the greater buy-in you're going to have, you know, the better they're going to take care of your oh, company, okay. the better service they're going to give your customers and the money comes. The, the people need the service. Oh yeah. You know, um, people aren't going to go, well, you know, that's too much money. I'm just not fixing my air conditioner. Or, you know what? We're just not going to have hot water. Yeah, it's you essential. Know, they're, they're not going to go without. They're just going to go without you. You've been in this 13 years. What's the most money you've ever made in a year? I asked that for a reason. People oh, need to know the possibilities, oh, the capabilities. Um, last year, 330. 330 for an HVAC technician or HVC replacement specialist consultant. You know, I mean, but you don't do the install. I, I don't. That's the only, <laughs> that's the <laughs> no, 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 I just wanted to point that out. I didn't mean yeah. to add. Yeah. I don't. That's a hard job anymore. Right. Right. You've done it. So you yeah, understand, I, you know I, how to talk. About yes. It. Yes. And I think that's also the best way to do it when, when you've done all facets of it. I, I, I see guys that come in. And they want to get to that sales position because mm -hmm. they know that's where the money is. Absolutely. But the guys that I've seen get in that position 
be four or five years of the field. They don't know enough. They don't do well. They might they might do good here and there. Like they're good at talking. They're good at, at maybe just selling whatever it might be. Whatever right. the widget, it doesn't matter. They're just good at talking. Um, but they don't ever have the success that I see from the guys that spent a good five years doing it. Um, whether that was a year or two install and then, you know, going into maintenance service and then eventually getting to where they can get into replacements. And I want to say, this is five years of doing it right. Not just five oh, years. Correct. Not just, oh, hey, hey, I, I, work, I work for Fred's, plunk, yeah. Fred's HVAC yeah. company. Yeah, you got you got to do it right. I think, you know, you've got to pay your dues. With a good company. Yeah. That offers training. For sure. There's, there's so many people that want things quick. You know, the instant gratification that that so many people want you're not going to get it if you get it to me it's going to be short-lived i've seen so many people come in and out you know of that position the ones that i see that thrive they've done it all you know at some point they've been they've installed a unit they they may or may not have done it as an install position but maybe they've done it right and they know how hard it is to do it and do it well they have a sense of pride, you know, for those guys and what they have to go through. Mm -hmm. They can convey that better to the homeowner when it comes to making a good install for a support one. Mm -hmm. um, if they've been, you know, lucky enough to work for a company like I have, and the, the two companies I work for were the top two companies in the area, when you learn from the beginning to install it that way, you see the crap you're taking out. You bet. You see how much better it was that you put it, even if you don't understand why that better is better. Man, it sticks out like a sore thumb when they're bad. And then being able to communicate to the homeowner what's bad about it. Um, I mean, putting all those things together, a good solid five years, and heck, it might even take you longer. You know, the, 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 the position might not be available where you're at. It took me nine 10 years to get into to replacements, you know, and to get into sales. But along that way, I did better every single year. I mean, Isn't that huge? Know your growth. Yeah, yeah. I got better at what I did. I never tried to do anything fast. I just tried to do it as good as I could. And I wanted to do it as, as good as it could be done. Um, and I wanted to know what the best way to do it was. So, you know, I researched, you know, I, I looked at the manuals. What's the right way to do it? And then I think, okay, well, if that's right, could I do it any better? Is there a better way to do it? And I would do that. And each year I just got better, 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 better. The last several years, the last several years, even as a, just a service tech, not into sales, I was still doing over six figures. No college degrees. Did you ever think getting out of high school, you'd make a hundred, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars a year? Yes. You just didn't know how. I didn't know how. I had somebody say something one time about how they were going to make more money than me. And then I look now and I'm like, I'm making double what they make. Um, I'm like, I would have never said that to anybody. Yeah. You know, oh, you're not ever going to. I just didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, I just, I knew I wanted to like what I wanted to do. I wanted to feel free. That's something that's great about this industry. Like, I do not like being stuck in an office. Mm -hmm. um, I like the fact, I mean, I'm driving wherever. To every different call um it's a little adventure you know taking care of customers yeah helping people i really like it there's uh, a lot of potential um and like i said just focus on doing things oh whoops sorry i thought that was off but doing things for the right reasons doing them the best that they could be done you know figuring out what is the best you know how do you figure out what the you know the best way to do something is Read the stinking manual. It'll tell you exactly how it needs to be done. As long as you do it that way, uh, I promise you'll, you're going to do it right. You know, now if you can think of a better way to do it, great. You know, um, but yeah, there, there's there's a lot of earning potential. What I like about it is you're, you're not capped. You're the only person limiting, you know, your potential. Are you glad you got into the trades? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. It's pretty easy. Isn't yeah. I, th I, I, so I thought I was going to have a motorcycle shop. Right. No, no, I understand that. Yeah. So, so my idea after doing motorcycles and loving it so much was that I wanted to run a motorcycle shop, but 
I didn't have anybody that I trusted to actually run the shop because I wanted to do the work. Right. I didn't want to do the work. Run. Michael Gerber says you can't be the technician, the manager, and the entrepreneur. No, no. So it's hard. You know, um, I actually before my brother had went to the services, I wanted him to do it with me, and you know, I kind of wanted him to go to school for business, even if it was just like community college stuff, just some business classes to know how to run the business side, so I could do, you know, the side that I like, the tinkering, um, and it just. It, th- that didn't work out. He went his way. And then I shortly went after, like, he went into the military Thanksgiving of 08, and I started school January of 09. And, um, you know, I still thought, okay, well, I'm going to get all these credentials. I'm going to work in a dealership for so many years. My plan was to kind of get a bike, customize it, flip it, and I thought I'd flip, flip, flip to I had the capital to start a business and then go on my own. And yeah, you Rick, know, Rick Charles has done yeah. that. It works. Yeah. Yes, it does. It does. Um, it can. Uh, it's not easy, but I kind of saw all the things that were done wrong where I worked. Mm-hmm. But again, you know, here comes my buddy. Okay. And I'm like seeing this kid that was never did anything doing well. I like that. And then I was like, well, you know what? Let me go try this. And uh, it, it's it's been great. So if you could go back out, go back in time to the day that you first walked out the door after high school to go get a job. Knowing what you know now. I'd have started this then. You, you're, 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 uh, yeah, you're going oh, back. You're oh looking at, at a little Joey coming out the front door and just say, okay, Joe, look, you don't know me, but you, you know that I look like you. Yeah. What would you tell yourself? If I would have done this then, I I just, I can't even imagine where I'd be right now. You know, the, uh, I've got a great job, great company. Um, the, uh, I can provide well for my family. If I would have started this 10 years earlier, oh my gosh, I probably have my house paid off right now. You know, like everything I have, I wouldn't be making payments. I'd be paid off. Absolutely. Like that's the difference. A decade. You know, you make enough now. You could pay off your house in a year or two if you really wanted to. You know, that's the plan. Is it's a great deal. Yeah, uh, no, I mean it is the financial freedom. You know, Um, and you know, again, working for a great company, kind of knowing what a great company should do. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, that's a big deal. The the healthcare, the four hundred one k. You know, that stuff's great. You know, and that goes back to caring about your people. You know, Um, you know, Josh and Michael, they're they're wanting to make sure that the people come work for them are set up when they can't work anymore. Yeah. You know, I have never heard of or seen, you know, any other company where they've brought in, you know, other like financial consultants to try and tell people and educate them, you know, about 401ks and stuff. Yeah, you, you make know. good money, keep it. Yeah. You yeah. know, um, I, I mean, I've talked to other people in this industry about that. Like, man, we never had anybody come and talk to us about this. They care for their people. That's cool. You know, that's that's the biggest thing. And you get with a company where, you know, the company cares about the people, it, it's going to do well. You, the, I, I don't see how you can care about people in an industry where you work for people and not be successful. And yes, if I'd have done it 10 years ago, I'd probably have an Escalade instead of a Denali. There you go. Have a little bit bigger, better house, have a little bit better, bigger, better things maybe. Or maybe it had the same things and they'd be paid off and I'd just have more money in the bank. I like that. You know, I'd have more money set aside for my, my kid's school, things like that, you know. Um, but, you know, I, I guess our, you know, our path leads us to where it's going to lead us. Based on every decision we've ever yeah. made. Yeah. So, you know, I tell you, if I would have started 10 years earlier, hell, it might have taken me 10 years to figure out what's the right company. I got that. You know, so I could have spent the, the first 10 years doing this, maybe doing the same or marginally better than what I did on my other gigs. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, who, who knows? It, it might have taken 10 years to get into the right company. So I think that's a big thing, too, is is knowing what you need out of a company, Love not that. not just the trade. Um, the trade's great, all of them. Again, every single house has got electricity. It's got plumbing. It's got a roof. And it's got air conditioning and heating. They're not going anywhere. It's a great field to get in. 
And I, it seems like the further we go into the future, the less people want to do physical mm-hmm. work. So the more money we're going to make. Yes. Yes. Like, gosh, man, the potential is awesome, you know, and, um, the, uh, and then knowing, knowing what to look for in a company. This has been good, Joe. Thank you. Ah, you're welcome. Thank you. It's been fun.